Good evening. Um, I am Brooke Lament, and it is my pleasure as director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Library and Museum to welcome you to this evening's virtual exhibit opening, Women in Uniform. This exhibit is now open to the public at the museum in Grand Rapids, and it will be on display through May 6th. COVID protocols and details for ticket purchases can be found on the Library and Museum's website. Tonight, we have the privilege of hearing from both the Director of Naval History, in addition to the head curator of the Navy Art Collection from the US Navy's History and Heritage Command. There will be an opportunity to ask questions of our presenters at the end of the program, and to do so, please use the Q&A box located on your screen. Rear Admiral Samuel J. Cox, U.S. Navy retired, serves as the Director of Naval History as well as the Curator of the U.S. Navy. He is responsible for the Navy's museums, art and artifact collections, the research library, 150 million pages of archives, and for collecting and interpreting U.S. Naval history throughout the world. Director Cox graduated with distinction from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1980, winning the Trident Scholar Prize for his independent research project, U.S. Foreign Policy and Naval Strategy in China, 1945 through 1950, as well as the prize for the history major with the highest standing. Director Cox also holds a master's degree in military art and sciences from the U.S. Army Command and General Staff College, earning the U.S. Army designation as a mil military historian. In his 37-year naval career, Director Cox served as an intelligence officer, retiring in November 2013 as the senior naval intelligence community leader and from both command of the Office of Naval Intelligence and as director of the Na National Maritime Intelligence and Integration Office. On December 29, 2014, he became the 14th director and curator of the Navy. Director Cox's awards include the Bronze Star, the National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medal, as well as numerous other military unit campaign and individual medals. Following Director Cox's presentation, we will hear from Gail Monroe. Ms. Monroe has worked at the Navy Art Collection since October 1989, being appointed head curator in 1997. Before that, she worked at the Smithsonian Institution and the Army Center of Military History. She has more than 40 years of federal service, her first position being a summer hire at the Comptroller of the Currency Library in the Ford Administration in 1976. A native of Washington, D.C., Ms. Monroe earned an MA in American History from the University of Maryland in 1989. Please join me in welcoming Director Cox and Head Curator Monroe to our virtual stage. Uh, yeah, uh, hey, it's an honor for me to be able to speak uh, tonight. Uh, my intent is to uh, give a, a short history of uh, women in the Navy, since that's what I know about the, the Navy. Uh, when I first went to the Naval Academy in uh, 1976, I was, I was actually surprised to discover that I was in the first class that had women uh, in it, the class of 1980. And it came with uh, quite a bit of controversy at the time uh, revolving around the Academy's mission was to prepare midshipmen morally, mentally, and physically to be combat officers in the US Navy. And the combat exclusion for women, which was a matter of law, was still in effect. So the result was a, a pretty difficult transition. Uh, and my greatest respect goes to those women who came in, in with my class uh, and went on to break uh, incredible new ground uh, despite uh, a lot of uh, adversity. And that theme is actually of adversity goes back all the way to the beginning of women you know, in the Navy. Uh, there have been women on ships going back to uh, the beginning of the Navy, but generally a handful usually disguised as men, uh, but no one in the active service role. Uh, one of the first women to actually operate in command aboard a ship was actually Harriet Tubman during the Civil War, African-American uh, former slave who led 150 African-American soldiers on a raid on three Union Navy uh, gunboats deep into uh, plantation country and uh, rescued, uh, released 700 slaves. 
but she wasn't, you know, in the Navy. Uh, later on in the Civil War, the, the Navy created a hospital ship uh, on the Mississippi River uh, that was staffed by uh, volunteer nuns uh, and also several African American escaped slaves women were hired as boys uh, to assist the nuns as acting as nurses. Uh, but none of them were actually in the Navy per se. And then after the Civil War, there was there was nothing until the uh, the formation of the Navy Nurse Corps in 1908. And they weren't actually in the Navy either. They were essentially akin to a contract uh, civilian employee of the Navy. Uh, but 1908 was was their foundation. Um, and then the, the big impetus for bringing women in the Navy the first time was uh, the outbreak of World War I. Uh, and even before the start of the war, you know, Navy leaders uh, figured that the Navy was gonna go in a major expansion uh, if we went into war. And in fact, the 1916 uh, Military Appro Naval Appropriations Act you know, dramatically expanded the Navy uh, it turned out that the Secretary of the Navy, uh, Josephus Daniels, uh, in the Wilson administration, uh, was known for progressivism uh, as long as it involved white people. He was actually a staunch segregationist, so nothing he did benefited African Americans. Uh, but he looked at the 1916 law and saw that there was nothing in it that uh, said he couldn't bring women into the Navy, the Naval Reserve, which had been established by that law. So about two weeks before President Wilson declared war, uh, the Navy actually started recruiting women to come in uh, and serve uh, in the Navy. Uh, this met with uh, considerable resistance, both in the, uh, the formation of the policy and even afterwards. Uh, but the result was during World War I, 11,000 uh, women came into the Navy uh, most of them were in a branch that was called the Yeoman F. Uh, sometimes it was called Yeomanettes, or, but that, that wasn't the official designation. Uh, the, it was a Yeoman and the F stood for a female. And they did a lot of, you know, mostly clerical work, but some uh, worked in intelligence, some worked in munitions factories, uh, and they freed up men to go forward uh, into, into ships. In fact, for every one woman they brought in, they sent two men forward, uh, which is an indication of the uh, better efficiency of the women. Uh, and it actually worked really great. Uh, there, was, there was considerable challenges, uh, but the women performed extremely well, uh, far beyond the expectations of many of, of the doubters. Uh, and the senior Navy officials uh, were, were quite pleased. Uh, however, when the war ended, it's like, whoop, no need for women anymore. And uh, within a matter of months, uh, almost all of them had been uh, demobilized and, and sent home. Uh, then with a, a struggle for, uh, to get the benefits of their male counterparts, uh, which eventually they got, but not, uh, not very easily. So the nurse corps continued uh, throughout all of this. Um, a number of them and a number of the yeomanettes uh, died of the Spanish influenza uh, during the war. That was the biggest source of casualties uh, among, among the women. Uh, but in uh, 19, by 1923, the first women actually went aboard ships as nurses uh, on board a hospital ship uh, relief. Uh, but that was it. World War II breaks out in December of 1941 for the Americans when we're, we're attacked. And it takes until July of 1942 uh, before President Roosevelt approves the establishment of the, the Naval Reserve for Women, uh, also more popular known as the WAVES or Women Accepted for Voluntary Emergency Service. And that turned out to be a significant number of uh, up to 86,000 uh, women in the WAVES served during World War II. Again, almost entirely clerical work or, or nurses uh, some of the nurses became what was called flight nurses, and uh, one of them actually was on, the, on Iwo Jima uh, while the fighting was still going on, which may have been the first Navy woman to actually be uh, in a combat zone. But again, when that war ended, there was quick demobilization of, of, most, of most of the Navy, to be honest, uh, but almost all of the women. But uh, the women had performed so well that senior Navy leaders were looking for a way to make a, get a new law passed 
uh, that would allow women to serve uh, continuously. And they succeeded under the Truman administration in 1948 uh, with the uh, uh, Women's uh, Service Integration Act. Um, they came with restrictions. The women couldn't be more than 2% of the force. Uh, they couldn't have more than 106, which Navy is a captain and Army is, is a colonel, Air Force is a colonel. Uh, and they were still barred from serving in any kind of combat. And that's essentially how it continued until uh, the late Vietnam era when uh, Admiral Zumwalt became the chief of naval operations and did some major shakeups of, of the Navy, both in the terms of uh, race relations, but also women relations and, and started the process of opening up a lot more opportunities for women. And this again, uh, provoked backlash. Uh, it, it, uh, there was considerable controversy. Uh, it was a tough uphill fight for the women to get these uh, more advanced positions. But the big breaking point, as difficult it was, was putting the, getting the women into the service academies. Uh, being able to be uh, officers from the academy gave them, uh, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, some credibility that they didn't have before. And since then, it's been pretty steady progress up until, up until now. It actually continues now more in uh, 1994, the combat exclusion uh, rule was waived so women could serve on combat ships. So they started going on, you know, aircraft carriers and amphibious ships and, you know, not just tenders and, and hospital ships. Uh, and by the, the mid 2000s, you know, some of the women had moved up in, in the ranks uh, and were entering very, uh, very uh, responsible senior positions to the point where uh, we had, you know, Admiral Michelle Howard uh, was the first African-American uh, four star, uh, the vice chief of naval operations, and then the commander of US Naval Forces in, in Europe. Uh, and uh, also uh, Vice Admiral Nora Tyson, who was the first uh, woman to actually command an aircraft carrier battle group. And today we have uh, Captain Bauer Schmidt, who is actually the first woman to command an actual aircraft carrier, and she's currently on deployment, you know, now. So in 2016, you know, all the parts of the Navy were opened up, including submarines, including SEALs, you know, if you could qualify. Uh, submarines, women have qualified. SEALs, uh, the, you know, they're still in support roles. I don't know that there's any women actually qualified SEALs yet, but but the opportunity uh, is there. So most of this progress has occurred in, in only the last 40 years out of, you know, the last 240 of the Navy. Uh, and it's a credit to the capability of, of the women who, uh, one, you know, went through uh, some of those challenges and, and then uh, in crisis and combat have proved themselves. Uh, you know, we've lost several on, on the coal and in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, so they serve the, the same way with the same sacrifice and risk uh, as the men do and, and they've, they've excelled. So that's uh, the you know, history of women in the Navy in, in, uh, in a nutshell. Uh, at this point, I hand it off to uh, Gail Monroe, who's our you know, senior art curator uh, who's been around for quite a long time, as, as you do, and, and she is indeed a, a fount of uh, extraordinary uh, expertise. Uh, and I think you'll find uh, what she has to say quite, uh, quite interesting. So thank you. You've just heard about how women have been integrated into the Navy, but now I'd like to tell you how art has been integrated into the Navy. A lot of people think of it as an oxymoron. It is not. There are days when I think naval intelligence is an oxymoron, and that's not one either. Um, but we're going to focus on na Navy art depicting women in the collection. Um, the quick and dirty answer is there are many ways that art has come into the Navy, but there are some milestones that are worth noting. Of course, I'm, what we know today as the Navy art collection um, is a combination of two collections that grew up in the Navy. First, when President John Adams ordered, ordered the creation of the Navy Department Library in 1800, his instructions were to include charts and images that would be useful for the Navy's development. The library still ho holds an 1824 ledger book, which lists some of its early acquisitions. And on the flyleaf is a list of the earliest paintings that they acquired. 
which were portraits of the founding fathers and early naval heroes, <laughs> some executed by John Wesley Jarvis. Um, we no longer have these paintings. Uh, some or all of them are at the Naval Academy in Annapolis, though some are, it's been rumored that some were given to the Library of Congress. Um, actually, I think most if not all of them are at the Naval Academy. The second part of the collection is often referred to as the combat art collection. That's probably what we are more famous for. Um, that's sending out artists into forward areas, sometimes combat zones to observe Navy activities, battles, Navy personnel at work, and creating artwork based on what the artists see. All the services have had combat artists at various times though we each do it in our own way. The Navy um, credits the founding of our combat art program to artist Griffith Bailey Cole. Cole was a well-connected society um, artist muralist actually in New York City and believed in many that many did in um, 1941 that war was imminent. And he had been impressed by the British war art program in World War I, and he wanted to make sure that United States artists would be on the scene for what was coming. Um, he tried and failed to get a message uh, meeting with President Roosevelt, but met Admiral Chester Nimitz at a Naval Academy football game and arranged a meeting with him to pitch his idea. Nimitz liked the idea and he gave Cole connections within the Navy and the combat art section was soon formed in the Bureau of Public Affairs and Cole was its first artist. Um, there are other art programs associated with the Navy and we'll talk about those as, as we come to them. For our purposes, I'm putting the artworks that I'm showing you now in date order, uh, more or less though there are different ways you can sequence the art in this exhibit we're going to digress into the background of the creation of these artworks as we go. Now you will note I'm starting off with a printed item, which is a poster, um, Navy art collection. We, we think of ourselves as collecting the visual culture of the Navy, so we just don't stick to paintings and sculpture. We collect um, printed matter other matter. Um, there are some places where we don't stray, which is, which is like fiber art. We don't do that because the uh, different department has um, better storage for that sort of thing. <clears throat> but here we have a poster from World War I called What the Navy is Doing, Join the Hospital Corps. And though recruiting posters were used in the military way back to the Revolutionary War, uh, they were just occasional printings until World War I, which happened to coincide with the golden age of illustration and improvements in color printing processes. Uh, very offices, various offices of the government took advantage and massive printings of posters resulted. One series of posters that started in World War I and continued into the 1920s was the What the Navy is Doing series. These posters usually feature a photograph, with an informational paragraph. Today we love them because they show you little slices of history that you don't always find in a book. This one is Join the Hospital Corps. This is actually a recruiting poster for men. Women weren't accepted into the Hospital Corps until World War II, but as you can see in this World War I poster, women are present. Women could serve in the Navy Nurse Corps, um, but they served without rank as supernumeraries, as the Admiral said, like, um, like contract workers or excess personnel. And from the pictures, you can see that they're doing, what they're doing is anything but ex excess. So I sat and I thought, you know, why put women in these pictures at all? And I, my conclusion is that their presence conveys a level of caring that a group of exclusively men wouldn't convey. You can draw your own conclusions, but, but that's what I think. Let's see, let me try and move on. 
Um, here's a picture of a yeoman F in her uniform. Um, it was painted just after World War I, um, but the artist herself was a yeoman F during the war in Washington, D.C., and though we know this is not a self-portrait. The Navy commissioned this painting in 1925, back when such things were possible, um, for an exhibit of Navy uniforms at the Sesquicentennial Exposition in Philadelphia in 1926. In the following year, the artist opened an art school in DC, which she ran with her husband until the 1950s. Mm. Well, we've already noted that the combat art section began in 1941. Griffith Bailey Cole quickly proved its worth when he was an eyewitness to the sinking of the Reuben James, did some drawings which were immediately published, very popular, informed the public. Um, the worth of the combat art section was Proven. Uh, there were soon six artists, and by the end of the war, there were eight. These artists were sent to every part of the globe and some stateside locations with the goal of producing artwork that could be used to publicize the war effort. The press was heavily censored in World War II, and dramatic images of the war effort were popular. The paintings and drawings, as we see in this case, were published in magazines and loaned to exhibits. Thus, um, from that effort, we traced the start of our traveling exhibit program. And actually until, gosh, about two years ago, we still had some of those World War II crates that we used to ship our exhibits. We've since replaced them. Um, this is by Dwight Scheffler. He was a New England artist, um, Massachusetts specifically, but before the war, he focused his art on skiing and sailing. And after the war, he actually went back to that. He was one of the earliest recruits to the combat art section and traveled widely. He was at the Battle of Guadalcanal and after some time in the studio, went to England to cover the invasion preparations and went ashore at Normandy. He turned in this particular drawing at the end of the war with a group, group of miscellaneous items so we're not really sure exactly where he saw this scene, though I know he visited a number of bases. Um, my best guess is that he drew this locally in New England. When he was between his deployments, he was allowed to work in his personal studio, though like modern remote workers, he occasionally had to go to a base to turn in forms, paperwork, or receive messages. Most of the combat artists um, wrote their own captions, which we try to use today as much as possible. So when you're in the gallery at the museum and you read the caption, those are Scheffler's very own words. Um, let me pause for a moment and tell you how the combat artists work. Uh, it still carries through to today. Um, they carried some of their art materials and a camera with them. And when they were in combat, when they were in combat areas and some one usually handed them a gun or a light weapon um, when they were going over the side of a ship on an invasion. Um, we don't do that part today. Um, they usually did their sketching and quick works on the scene and after some time in the field came back to the States to complete more finished works. Uh, because space was short in Washington, they they were allowed to work from their home studios between assignments. When they were on ships, because they were junior offices, they stood watches just like every other junior officer. Um, this is a Navy nurse, very well, let me tell you her story. At the start of the, this is by, Albert Murray, before the war, he was already a noted portrait artist. So before he was sent off on any combat art assignments, he was first tasked with painting some of the early war heroes, and in this case, heroine. Um, 
and Bernatitis at the start of the war was serving in a US Navy hospital in the Philippines. She and other army nurses uh, continued to treat paid patients during the sieges of Bataan and Corregidor. But when Corregidor fell, Bernatitis was one of a group that was evacuated on the submarine USS Spearfish. She immediately became a symbol of heroism of military nurses. Murray was assigned to paint this portrait and it appeared in the media many times and in, in, in exhibits. Back in those days, um, museums were also trying to get into the patriotic mood by showing assemblages, sometimes of combat art, the National Gallery here in Washington, DC, which at that time was the, known as the Mellon Gallery and the Metropolitan in New York had a display of combat art paintings. And this one was included in those shows. Moving on from the works of the combat art section, we're gonna look at artwork created by the Abbott Laboratories Artist Program. The story of this program, as it has been passed on to me, is that at the beginning of the war, Abbott Labs was making huge profits from uh, sulfa drugs penicillin at a time when it was considered unseemly to make huge profits from the war effort. Go figure. As a way to show support for the war effort and to use some of the profits for the public good. And because the Abbott family was keenly interested in art, they partnered with Associated American Artists, which was an organization that included some of the most successful artists in the country. And, the, um, and they also partnered with the US military. Abbott paid, it, paid the artist expenses and the military allowed them to accompany military units at home and abroad. Frequently, but not always, they focused on uh, medical topics. Some of the most famous artists in our collection come from this group. Um, Thomas Hart Benton is one, though he did not do any pictures of women, so he is not included in this show. This is a picture by um, painting, very small one, you'll see it, of a Navy nurse in a hospital at New Caledonia. This is a painting of women doing medical art at a Navy hospital stateside by Carlos Anderson. And one not medical is Bomber Glamour by Howard Bear. Um, this was either painted at Naval Station Anacostia or Naval Station Norman, Oklahoma. We're not entirely sure Anacostia, of course, is near and dear to us because it's just across the river from the Washington Navy Yard where we work. Uh, the third group of World War II artists represented in this show were the recruiting bureau artists. Even during the war, they were occasionally confused with combat artists, but the combat art section was very touchy about uh, recruiting poster artists being called combat artists. And I, there are nasty notes in the file about, about people making that mistake. Um, there, there were 17 naval districts and each one had its own recruiting poster division. The, John Falter is the artist of this painting. Um, he had done many Saturday evening post covers on a, not quite as many as Norman Rockwell, but I think he was a near rival of Rockwell. Um, but John Falter was specifically hired by the recruiting poster division in Washington to work on posters to recruit waves. At the end of the war, um, the artists were demobilized and in our files, we have some memos debating a, about what was going to happen to the artwork. Eventually it was decided that the combat art would remain with the Office of Public Affairs, which eventually evolved into the Chief of Information or Chinfo as we call it today. The Abbott artists 
had worked for all the services. And in the end, Abbott divided up the collections, gave, gave the artwork to what they deemed to be the appropriate services. And it, um, what came to the Navy ended up with the combat art section. Most of the recruiting bureau art was returned to the artists. Um, it had been used to publish posters and they figured they didn't need it anymore. And that's why it keeps turning up at auction. As a matter of fact, there's two that are about to come to auction next month. Um, for unknown reasons to us, some of Falter's Waves art got left behind and came to the Naval Historical Center, which is now the Naval History and Heritage Command, um, came to us fairly soon after the war. Uh, the art programs demobilized with the rest of the service. They tried, well, there were three artists during the Korean War, though there are no pictures of women from that war because the three artists were in combat zone constantly. They never went to a hospital or anything. They were always under fire, it seems, or on a ship that was shooting. Um, so there are no Korean War pictures in this one. Um, after the Korean War, the combat art went into hiatus. The idea was a rock revived a few years later, late 1950s, and it was largely championed by a civilian artist, George Gray, who is a member of the Salma Gundy Club in New York City. That's an artist club. Uh, Gray worked with the chief of information to develop short-term travel opportunities for members of his club, and eventually to include the West Coast, um, they reached out to Holly House, which was a West Coast Arts Club. The artists went on invitational travel orders at the Navy's expense from the early 1960s to the time the program died out in the early 1980s due to lack of funding. They traveled to every corner of the globe, including the Arctic and Antarctic. Uh, the name of the program was, okay, we pronounce the acronym NACAL, N-A-C-A-L. That means Navy Artist Cooperation and Liaison. I still don't understand it, but that's what it is. Anyway, each NACAL assignment had to have a goal. And since it was an era when women's roles in the military were expanding as well, assignments highlighting that were included. This is um, from one of the NACAL trips, Alice DiCaprio. Um, the NACAL program came to an end in the early 1980s as funding ran out. But as I like to think, the idea of documentation of art had become so normal that it, um, in the ensuing years, it wasn't a matter of whether there would be artists, but where they would come from. Um, here's one that came to us. This is from the Bosnian War. Welcome to Sarajevo. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, our artists tended to be active reservists. Um, they, I mean, they, these were reservists who just, for the lack of a better term, they, they got noticed. And once they got noticed, they got activated and somebody came up with money to send them somewhere. Monica Allen Perrin uh, was one of these terrific artists. Um, she lives in France now, I think. But um, she went to Sarajevo first and later on we had her going to Desert Shield and Storm. Um, like NACAL, there had been occasional tra invitational travel orders. Um, during Bosnia, Desert Shield, Desert Storm, we had three reserve offices, that's Monica, who managed to connect with public affair units and go into action for us. Then, um, just a fluke in the 1990s, I had um, a couple of enlisted guys assigned to the art gallery to be picture framers. They were draftsmen um, and goodness knows they were both exceptionally talented, talented artists. They came one after the other, but there was a little overlap in between. 
So I tend to think of them together. But um, this was Eric Murray, African-American gentleman who was keenly concerned for the lack of um, art depicting African-Americans in the collection. Um, he did something to help us and I able, was able to come up with some travel money and sent him off to a few other places. And he did a really iconic modern picture of USS Constitution under sail, which, you know, most of the time it's stuck in the Pentagon. It's in somebody's office because it's such a nice painting. Anyway, I love Eric's work. I'm just gonna, I need to move on. I'm, anyway, um, this is a painting by Morgan Wilbur. He is one of my current artists. I have two artists currently. Um, Morgan came to us. I think he first started working for us when he was the art editor of Naval Aviation News in the late 1990s. And um, eventually his billet was moved over to us and we've been sending him traveling whenever we can since then. He's been to Iraq and Afghanistan. This was a picture of a female CB in Afghanistan during the global war on terror. Um, as the, let's see, hold on. Okay, here is one of my other civilian artists, formerly one of my civilian artists. This is by Christopher J. Battles. Chris is now the artist in residence for the Marine Corps and an artist. A uh, gentleman named Doug Rowe has taken his place, who is also a terrific artist. But um, we sent Chris to a couple of battle groups and he was on a ship wandering around and he happened to walk into this welding shop and lo and behold, it was run by three women, which I don't know, it still seems rather extraordinary. But he did this painting, he did a couple other paintings of the women working on the, sh the ships that he visited. Um, you know, I, I love Navy art and I hope you do too. Um, we are moving on just as best as we can and we're gonna keep documenting women as long as we can. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Gail. That was very interesting. And I'm certainly looking forward to seeing the art in person as well. Um, so we're just a reminder that we are taking questions at this time. Uh, and we, it, to do so, please use the Q&A um, button at the bottom of the screen. And we'll do our best to, to get some of your, your questions answered here. So uh, Gail, it sounds like you do a lot of commissioned works, but is, is that the only way that you gather or collect art or are there are various avenues that you use? No, there are various avenues. We take donations like any museum, um, tax deductible, uh, but also decommissioning ships, closing bases. You know, guys on ships will pick up paintings in the oddest places. And if like ship's property, when it decommissions, usually it will come to us. Also sponsors gifts when are frequently paintings, frequently a portrait of the ship when um, ships are commissioned. And when it's decommissioned, if the sponsor does not want it back, I mean, they're allowed a token gift back from the ship. Um, we get whatever they, they if they don't want it. Um, Let's see, we um, decommissioning ship, closing bases, lots of stuff have come from closing bases. And then I have my two combat artists or official artists, if you prefer, since we're not at war right now. <laughs> well, that's interesting. Like, do you also, like, know that the portraiture and the paintings, those are considered artifacts as yeah, you know, but I'm just wondering if there's other three-dimensional artifacts within the collection. We do have some sculpture, but we we mostly have busts and small items in our storage. My storage, if you saw it, is not geared towards three dimensions. 
so there is a great big warehouse uh, for three-dimensional artifacts down at Richmond and oversized sculpture, if they're not on a permanent site elsewhere, they end up down at Richmond. I, I do have a question as to whether there's a specific piece of art that seems to be the the most requested. Like uh, you know, I'm just curious as to what what you have in collection that might be you know heavily requested for for loan or for just to view. Sure. Um, the most famous painting in our collection is very controversial. Um, visit our website, www.history.navy.mil, um, um, but it's Paul Cadmus, The Fleet's Inn. It is a painting that the government tried to censor, oh, I forget, it's always, it's 1932 or 1934. It was part of the Public Works of Art pro Projects creations. It was sent to their big public exhibition at the Corcoran Gallery here in Washington. But before the show opened, the painting was yanked out of the gallery, um, actually carried off by the Navy Department. Henry Latrobe Roosevelt, the um, president's cousin, who was assistant secretary of the Navy, carried it away. Um, and it was not publicly seen until the early 1980s. Um, through him, his auspices, it ended up at the Alibi Club here in Washington, which is a private men's club. It hung over the fireplace there um, until the early 1980s. And the, um, yeah, the, it's, the complaint about the painting was, go, go look at it, um, is that it did not be, depict the Navy in a favorable light. It's some, Sailors on shore leave, hanging out with some floozies, other questionable characters, engaging in non-Navy behavior. I see. Right. We have it now. It was recovered in the 1980s, and we have it now. It travels a lot. As a matter of fact, I believe it's at Crystal Bridges right now. Oh, okay. Wow. Uh, yeah. Um, very interesting. Uh, so are, is there more art that's not within this exhibit that depicts current women leaders in the Navy or um, is that still in process? Yeah, I'm going to have to update the show at some point because both Chris Battles before he left us and my new artist Doug Rowe have been painting um, images, images of Navy women both at work and also just more formalized portraits, um, bringing the history forward. Okay. Yeah. And then, you know, one final question from me before we turn it over to Cleves, but is the Naval Museum located, uh, is it in Anacostia or is that in the, or are the, is the public able to come and view um, the materials at the Naval Museum? Um, the Navy Museum is on the Washington Navy Yard okay. and the public is allowed on the base. Be careful, um, I'm not sure of their hours. I tell you, I don't work in that building, so I'm sorry I don't keep up with it. I don't no, think they're open on Sundays. But we do have a little gallery over there and just about every painting on the wall in all the exhibits are our paintings as well. Um, okay. If there's something that's in storage and you want to arrange with us ahead of time and come on a weekday when we're in the office, anything that is on site is potentially viewable. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Gail and uh, Admiral Cox. And I'm going to turn it over to Gleaves. We're you know, really grateful for your attendance and presentations here today. Yes, thank you, Admiral Cox and Gail Monroe for terrific presentations to open our exhibit, Women in Uniform. I know our audience learned a lot. I know I sure did. I'm Gleaves Whitney, Executive Director of the Gerald R. Ford Presidential Foundation, and we are proud to partner with the Ford Presidential Library and Museum to bring you 
these innovative exhibits like Women in Uniform, as well as insightful speakers like Admiral Cox and Gail Monroe, whom we heard this evening. You know, programs like this evening's are what make the Ford a truly special place. If your mind was enriched by this evening's presentation, if your perspective was challenged, if you changed your mind about something, then we hosted a successful program and we, we hope that you will become a friend of Ford. To sign up, please visit our website at geraldrfordfoundation.org. That's geraldrfordfoundation.org. There we will find an array of resources to learn more about our 38th president, a lot of homework helpers for kids who are doing papers on President and Mrs. Ford, and wonderful explanations of past programs, uh, objects in the museum, and finding aids for the archive. Uh, you'll learn about the 38th president and his times, and especially you'll learn about virtue anchored leadership, which is very much needed in our present challenging times. So please consider joining us in the important work we do. Thank you and good night.